the young Peter Bedford lived the dream of thousands of teenage boys in the southern states of Australia. AFL football in winter and cricket for his state in summer. The highlight of his twin careers came in 1970, which started with five wickets in a Sheffield Shield fixture in February and ended with the Brownlow medal and his first and only final. Welcome, Peter. We'll never see that again. No, unfortunately. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of multi-talented sportsmen playing AFL football. Well, a couple uh, of contemporaries of yours. I mean, Craig Bradley managed to do it, but Robert Harvey, and yes. more recently Luke Hodge. Yeah. Uh, and obviously heap... Jonathan Brown yep. was a potentially uh, a very good cricketer. Currently yeah. Michael Hurley. Exactly. Do you, do you feel for those folks that they'll never get the opportunity to do what you did? I do, because I'm, I'm sure perhaps deep down with a lot of them, cricket would possibly be their preferred sport. but uh, Which it was with you. Which it was with me, yes. You still, yeah. So you say that unequivocally now, that your, your love was greater for cricket than it was for football. Oh, Mike, I, I was a cricketer who played football. Our blokes now are starting pre-season training in November. Yep. In a preparation for a season that starts in March. You were playing cricket up until, what, probably the last round of practice matches? Yeah, I was fortunate to play my cricket with Melbourne. In February, I'd... Uh, trained for cricket at the Albert Ground and then I'd shoot across the south and trained for footy on the same night. Mm. So that's what, 47 years ago coming up and uh, and I was very fortunate because Norm Smith coached South Melbourne through that period and his son Peter played with Melbourne as well. And, in cricket? Uh, in cricket, yeah, Peter yeah, played yeah. with Melbourne uh, in the first 11 and, yep. uh, and Norm would come and watch the matches on the Saturday and uh, I think in a sense he felt that Perhaps my cricket complemented my football to a degree, you know, whereby I, <coughs> I was still keeping physically active and uh, obviously if I was bowling a fair bit or perhaps getting a few runs, I was turning, turning over the, the mileage, so to speak, you know, with the body. Mm. 1970, there was a Shield game, uh, South Australia v Victoria, Adelaide Oval. Yes. You took your career best figures of five for 40. I did, yes. Yeah, so with, uh, with those... Leg spinners of yours. Yes, I, yeah. uh, I was a bit fortunate, I guess, because Blair Campbell was our frontline spinner. And Blair he played with Richmond? Richmond and Melbourne. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Melbourne. Uh, Blair broke down and uh, Bob Cowper was captain. And uh, I think uh, uh, we struck four days of century temperature and I used to room with Johnny Scholes. And Scholes and I had had a, a little bit of an evening that night before, <laughs> replenishing the fluids yeah. uh, lost on that day. And... Uh, when he said to me, it looks like you will, so he threw me the ball and I was fortunate enough to get five for 40 in a match which effectively won Victoria the Sheffield mm. Shield. I was fortunate enough, in one of the victims in that particular five for was Greg Chappell. Well, it's uh, not the only time you got uh, no, Greg Chappell, was it? No, the five for 40, as you say, were probably my best figures, but I think my actual best bowling was the day at the MCG, the first day of a Shield match. Um, Bill Laurie was captain and... Uh, I, for a person who was just so enamoured with cricket, to be able to get the two chapels, mm. uh, Ian and Greg, uh, you know, in that particular innings, I got four for, I bowled 23 overs, eight ball overs, and ended up with four for 78. Peter, do you think, do you think uh, with a bit of luck that you would have played test cricket? This might sound egotistical, but I think if, if I hadn't had football, I, uh, I would have, the drive, the drive would have been such that I think I would have, yeah, without football, I think I would have given myself a real, real good shot at it. Fact or fiction? The Victorian, you're captain for Victoria's Paul Sheehan. You're wrestling with the notion of perhaps being a full time cricketer and abandoning football. Did Timbers have some advice for you about the pay scales? Well, I remember, you know, when you're batting, you, you sit in the room and you, you talk about anything and everything, and. Uh, and we used to aggregate somewhere in the vicinity of twenty-seven to 28,000 to a Shield match in mm -hmm. those days, Mark. Uh, you know, three or four Friday, nine or ten Saturday and the Sunday, and three or four on the Monday. And I remember Timbers uh, saying to me, he said, you know what, Wheels, he said, the, the fellow working on the gate, the <laughs> Melbourne cricket ground, on the Sunday was getting more than we were for the four days. And, uh, yeah, so we used to get $7 a day. $7 20, a day. 28 bucks over the four yeah, days. Yeah. So the money considerations aside, you would have pursued cricket ahead of football? Oh, certainly, because I had three years with Port Melbourne in the VFA and in 66 I was uh, lucky enough to go to a football carnival in Hobart. Yep. Uh, I was at Turak Teachers College at the time as a 19-year-old and I went to the principal, Mr St Allen, requesting a 
two weeks leave of absence, which was granted. So we went across to Hobart, uh, where we played the North Hobart ground, and four games in 10 days. But when you're 19, you take it in your stride. And so I came back and uh, did teaching rounds and just loved going to the schools. And, that, and uh, then in the October that year, I was fortunate enough to get selected to represent uh, Victoria in cricket on the Western Tour. So I bowled into his office again, Mr St Allen, and I said, uh, Mrs Allen, um, I've been fortunate enough to get selected to represent mm -hmm. Victoria in cricket. Could have knocked me over the feather, Mark. He said, what do you want to do, son? Do you want to be a teacher or a sportsman? <laughs> I thought, well, at 19 years of age, it was a no-brainer. There's so only one answer for that. I had to, had to forego the teaching degree, and, and that was the time I determined that I wanted to see if I can go and play league, league football. And, and the opportunity to go to South, uh, we were given a, a lump sum of money, which I was... How much, Peter? Oh, I forget it. I forget now, Mark. Do you really? But it was... <laughs> we can't do an order, uh, order no, on it. No, no, but it was... It was a, Several thousand dollars, yeah. and which we were enabled us to put a deposit on on a house in one of the bank houses that they were in Garden City. So, so you crossed the younger brigade won't understand this, but there were there were clearances in those days. Yeah, you were tied to Port Melbourne in the VFA. Yes, they refused to clear you. Yeah, you left of your own volition, which meant that you could never go back to the VFA. No, I, I I left in that preceding week. South Beats and killed all the first round of sixty eight, the Lake Oval. And I'd uh, made up my mind where I was going. And South played St Kilda at uh, the old Glen Ferry ground, which was a bit of a baptism of fire for, mm. for any, any person playing there. So uh, and I remember that preceding week, Norm Goss and Darkie McFarlane would come down to our home in Garden City. And, you know, in those days, geographically, Port and South so close, but philosophically, mm. poles apart. And because Gossie was of the opinion that... Uh, South was sort of, from a footballing aspect, were raping and pillaging players and Port weren't getting anything in return, much in return. So they come down everyone, what are you going across to that rotten mongrel mob? They're no really? good. Oh, you know. So the feeling was that deep? Oh, it? it was deep. It yeah. was deep. And every night, pretty much. And uh, even uh, and in those days, Port being on the cusp of the city was like a big country town. Everybody knew everybody, you know. And... Uh, so uh, I remember walking, walking out the gate on that morning to play my first match. Alan Miller was coach. I was getting a ride with him. He just lived a couple of blocks down in Garden City. And uh, my wife, Brenda, you know, came after me and said, are you sure you're making the right decision? <laughs> you know, and because uh, as I say, 13 or 14 of the, the team were comprised of, the team was comprised of locals and all the girls and that, they'd be up in the stand and nattering, obviously, and that, and... Uh, Anyhow, I got out to got out to Glen Ferry, and um, I'm standing there watching the seconds. And uh, old Tommy Layup, who was a great mate of Norm Gosses, came up to me and he said, uh, "Peter, he says, uh, old Gossy wants to have a word with you." I said, "Oh, geez, so they're still trying." So, so this is an hour before the this game. is just before the yeah, game, yeah. leading into my first match. And uh, so I walked down beside the stand. They were outside the the gate there, you know. I thought, here they go, they're going to have another crack, you know, but. Mm. When I went down, Norm said, listen, forget about what's transpired over the last week. We knew you were going to go at some stage, but uh, we reckon cricket's your game. <laughs> and uh, so just, they wish me all the best and that was it. So I was surprised when I was researching you that you played 52 games for Port. Clearly, like, with the talent that you had, that's a long time to be in a secondary competition, isn't it? Yeah, but when I look back, Mike, I, I was more involved with cricket because I, I, I played Shield cricket as a 19 year old, albeit that first year we won, won the Sheffield Shield in 66-67 when Jack Potter was captain mm -hmm. and I was 12th man for pretty much the major part of that but it was good, it was a good sort of learning curve for me to watch, get to watch and learn and see how, how various players go about their, their cricket and uh, so uh, as I, again as I said earlier cricket Cricket was the mm, game which, mm. which I was enamoured with. When I ask you about your first, you've talked about your first game, playing for South against Hawthorne at Glenferry Oval. Yep. You line up against a seasoned campaigner called David Parker. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, that was. You would have been overawed, wouldn't I, you? I was. Yeah. You know, David had been a, a great, uh, great player and uh, captain of captain of uh, of Hawthorne, and uh, of course uh, I was second rover to uh, my idol as a as a youngster, Bobby Skill. Yep. And uh, so I started off in the forward pocket and uh, as 
we were told, you know, good forwards are leading up to the footy. And uh, so I, I tried to lead to the ball coming towards me and David grabbed me by the shorts and I said, don't do that, David, you know. And I sort of mumbled something and the you know, ball came down a little bit later and the same thing happened, grabbed me by the shorts and I said, don't, David, David, don't do that, you know. And uh, you know, a third time he did it and I thought, oh, a bit of the Port Melbourne came out of me, Mike, and I, uh, I sat him on his backside. You know? Did you so backhand it? I gave him a backhand, yeah. yeah, you know. In your first game? First game, yeah. You don't mess with Port boys, do you? <laughs> well, well, I, I warned him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's good, the Brownlow medal, the connotation is that you're a ball player, which you were. Yes. Fundamentally, you were. Yeah. But there's a couple of big names that, uh, Parkin wasn't the only one to incur your wrath, was he? Did you smack Bruce Dool? Oh, I... T- yeah, I think that was that was maybe accidental. Accidentally, accidental, yeah, I think so. Because Bruce, Bruce and I, you know, I love Bruce, and uh, we used to play on each other quite quite a bit in those days. And uh, uh, yeah, I I did. I I think Bruce sort of might have hit the turf one time, but mm. that might have been at a bit of frustration on my behalf because he might have been getting the ball a bit so too often. That too doesn't often. sound accidental <laughs> to me, Peter. But well, you can live with that. Another Carlton bloke. Yes. In fact, he recently retired chairman of the AFL Commission. He uh, qu- Every time he sees you, he queries the fact that you won the Brownlow medal, does he not? Not because you weren't good enough, but because yeah. that you were prepared to square up. Oh, well, it was. In, in those days, the one umpire, I think, you know... The, there seemed to be a, a lot more argy bargy, you know, in, in, in tight and that. And uh, you get a uh, you get a whack, and uh, you probably might wait a little while and seize an opportunity to perhaps, <laughs> you know, repay repay mm-hmm. it. And uh, I guess probably that might have happened with Mike. Mike was a was a ball player, but I think he he, he may have had a tendency at times to to go a little bit. He beyond, carried his arms pretty beyond, high beyond that, yeah. you know. So, so what you you. you... I, I think I might have got him around the, the nose area because uh, each time we go into a function, uh, uh, having pre-dinner drinks and that, and there's a crowd around, every time I seem to walk past, he seems to remind me of, that <laughs> I sort of put his nose out of joint a little bit. You know? I've got one more for you. Yep. Did you, did um, Graham John, yes. your coach at the time, drag you uh, in an intra-club practice game one day because you and Robbie Doyle were having a punch-up? Uh, yeah, I think that was true. That was true. I, I was probably hazy on this I stuff, was, isn't I, it? I was probably uh, fighting out of my division there. Well, he was two Ryan, feet taller than he was, you. Yeah, he was a lot taller, but yeah, uh, yeah sort of. So you were. For, I, I think I, I saw you play plenty of times. So I, I've got my own views about um, you, you're a ball player. You went for the footy, but I think you got sick of uh, the other clubs working you over because you were so important to South. I mean, you got a lot of attention, didn't you? Oh, I did, did, yeah, as, as did Skilts, of course, you know. Yeah, but we, Skilts had well, gone, I mean, in yeah, the bulk of your career. Yeah, I, yeah, I did, I did, and uh, I just felt like you, you had to try and sort of uh, give a bit back, really, otherwise if they just kept whacking you, <laughs> you know, they sort of get over the top of yeah, you a bit, but... Yeah. Uh, but no, it was sort of in those days. I, th- I think even umpires sometimes they'd see you get a whack, and you you might just give a, a bloke a little clip, you know. <laughs> and uh, they, often an umpire would say, "Oh, I saw what happened. You know, you you squared the ledger. Yep. Get on with the game." So they turned a blind so eye. Turned to turn it. a blind yeah, eye. Get yeah. on with the game. Yeah, so. I'm intrigued by 1970 wheels because you, 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 we talked about your shield performances that year. Yep. You play one practice game. Yes. And you go into a season. It was your best season, was it not? Oh, I think yeah, it was because I, yeah. I think uh, I won about eight awards that yeah. year, Mike, I, including the Brownlow, Brownlow. And you played in a final. Yes. Now you must have gone in, gone back to the Swans in very good nick to be able to do that. I, uh, well, exactly. As I say, I'd had a really good uh, cricket season. Mm. I think perhaps that bit of euphoria from that cricket season helped me into the leading to the into the footy season. You know, there so, you are. Yes, must yeah. bring back some good memories for you. Oh, it does. It was a fabulous day, and I'm 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 somewhat uh, disappointed that probably the the Brownlow medalist of the t- of the of the time now doesn't get that opportunity to run. I I was able to run a lap of honour with the ten non-participating captains on that day. Uh, St Kilda beat us in the first semi-final, mm-hmm. and that's second semi-final day, Mike, and. Uh, you know, I was able to run a lap of honour with uh, Rossi Smith and Billy Goggin there and Kevin Murray, you can yeah. see in the photos. Yeah. And, uh, and we had a, had a 
a lunch down below or brunch down below and then ran through a banner and a lot of the former winners formed a guard of honour. And then, as I say, I was able to run that lap of honour uh, with the 10 non-participating mm. captains. So it was a memorable day, really. That, that year, 1970, was the year you played your only final? It was. First semi? Same with Skills. Yeah. As well. yeah. Skills was injured, wasn't he, that day? We had a couple who weren't quite right mm. and... Uh, St Kilda jumped us early and uh, we played a fabulous second quarter to lead by about four points, I think, at, at half-time. I think it might have been 9-9 nine, nine to 9-5. Nine, and I remember speaking with Smithy that night and he said, oh, he just didn't want the half-time siren to ring, you know, because we were just sort of... we were playing so well. And then, obviously, uh, with the break, you know, St Kilda were able to sort of reassess things and they came out... and. They were a pretty strong side and they just sort of wore us down, Mike, in that second half. You are much happier talking about your cricket achievements than your football achievements. Oh, I, I love my cricket. I was, I was a, as I said, I, I was a cricketer who played football, yeah. Mike. Yeah. I would have thought, I must say, I would have liked being able to hang Charlie around my neck. <laughs> yeah. It was a fabulous night. It was, a, you know, it was the first televised one. It was here at Dallas, 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 Dallas Brooks Hall. Hall. And, yeah. and it's funny, just a, a little bit more to that, Mike, I... Uh, how things have changed because I, I reckon I've encountered several hundred females since that time, and they tell me what a great time they had. What does that. encountered mean, Peter? Oh no, just just met run, them. Met them, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, yes, yeah, yeah, met, met them. Yeah. And uh, they tell me what a great time they had, Brownlow night, you mm. know. And I look them straight in the eye, and I don't want to rain on their parade because I know full well that they weren't there because it was an all-male affair. There wasn't a solitary female. Is that right? At the Brownlow solitary, couch? There wasn't a solitary female You imagine there. that today? I know. Yes. Yeah. There's so not one female no. was an invited guest to the 1970 Brownlow. Exactly. Mm. Gee. Yeah. How would it been if Caroline Wilson had been going <laughs> for the age? You mentioned Norm Smith. He's yep. a legendary figure in football. Six premierships in ten years at Melbourne. Yep. Went to South Melbourne and took a pretty motley collection of players uh, to the finals when, when we had a final four. Yes. What are your memories of Smith, the coach? Oh, I would have loved to have played my entire career. He was, a, he was very tough, very hard, but very fair. And uh, I remember he, um, we, uh, we had a lot of young fellas from the Riverina playing at that time too. And uh, Smithy was like a father figure to us, you know, uh, and uh, he had a room built at the side of the of the medical room, which had two two uh, uh, two trestles down the side, you know, which accommodated mm. you know half and half of the team. And he'd be up the front with his white hanky going, and <laughs> and you you obviously sit flush on the on the stool, and then halfway through his speech, you'd virtually be standing up. He, he just had that ability to, and quite honestly, I reckon we'd have all run through a brick wall for mm. Norm Smith, and uh, that was the the motivation he had. And well, he, that was probably the best example of that was Bobby Skilton's last game. Yes. Uh, and by all accounts, a rousing address from Smithy. Yes. Uh, yeah. Which prompted you to go out and kick seven goals in yeah. the win over North Melbourne. North Melbourne. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh well, you know, sort of just. Uh, uh, Skills had given so much to the club, and as I say, and, and uh, he'd uh, given me that uh, desire to go out and, and be the best I could be. Mm. And so, I guess in that final match, I, I just wanted to try and mm. make it make it an important occasion for him. I spoke to a couple of your ex-teammates, uh, Rick Quaid and Ray Ball, about you. Yep. Quaid had an interesting comparison for me uh, through all these years. On he likened you to Sam Mitchell. Right. Your, your awareness of what was happening around yeah. you, your ability, your creativity, use of handball, uh, and just an all-round all round package. You, is that a fair comparison? Oh, well, Sam Mitchell's been a terrific player, yeah. you know, and to, to be compared with Sam is... Yeah. Did you agree with that? You agree yes. with the way you played your footy? He said you were light years before the rest of the team. You'd do things, you'd handball to where they should yeah, be. Well, and they I was, yeah, there. sometimes, yeah, I'd, I'd sort of have the ball ready there, and, and, and I, <laughs> I noticed that... When I played state footy, it was a different kettle of fish because yeah. the players were there, you know. Whereas sometimes at South, the players were were just <laughs> where they shouldn't be. They shouldn't just Jack Dyer's yeah. Peter, why did you leave South after not one one hundred and seventy eight games, which is solid, but yeah. 
Um, I don't know. And you ended up I, at Cal. It wasn't, it wasn't on my volition. It wasn't? No, no. I, it was funny, at the end of the season, the 75, Jezza was captain of the state side and I was vice captain and, and Big Nick was coach, you know, uh, captain. And uh, I had a good year in 75 and in 76, uh, Stewie, who, Ian Stewie was a fabulous player, of course, and I reckon Stewie was a good coach, but for some reason or another, we just didn't sort of gel, and I had a very, very average year. And right at the end of the season, I think the old Sunday Observer, which was around for a little while, Mike, mm -hmm. uh, had an article in there saying that my style of footy didn't suit his coaching or something, and, and the, the comments were attributable to, to, uh, to Ian, Ian Stewart. And so he rang, rang, rang me up, and uh, we're living in South Melbourne, just opposite the orphanage there at that time, and he said, I'm coming down to see you. So he came down and spent about two, two and a half hours with us and, as I say, vehemently denied that those comments were attributable to him. And uh, anyhow, I said, oh, fair enough. So, anyhow, Did you believe him? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know, <laughs> you know, sort of... Uh, well, you know, no, he told me... He told, he, well, that's what he told me, anyhow. So, But with, two weeks later, I was, I was off to Carlton and when I went there... I'd, in those days, we used to have the after matches, you might mm, you recall, yeah, Mike. Yeah. And so you got to know pretty much every player and every team. You'd, you'd sort of, you know, you'd obviously have a chat after the match and, and that. And so, and I had some really good mates at Carlton. So when I when I I got there, I thought, oh, I'm going to try and make the the best of, of this, you know, because great, I was good mates with Dooley and, and Jezza and uh, Robbie Wolves, Jeff Southby, mm. you know. We played a game. I think it might have been an Escort Cup game as they were in those days, Mike, uh, out at Waverley. Played Melbourne. And I gathered the ball and just weaved through the middle and Melbourne player put his foot out and made what I thought was fairly light contact. And I thought, geez, that hurt. You know, I said to the doctor after the match, I said, do you mind if I get this x-rayed? He said, yeah, not a problem. So the x-rayed and I had two fractures in the ankle. Wow. So I was out for the rest of the season and I was just on 30, 30 then. And uh, lo and behold, uh, Carlton appointed a new coach the following year, uh, Ian Stewart. So, <laughs> so but anyhow. Yeah. So, well, you only you played one game the following year. Yes. And it was yeah. against South against Melbourne. Against South at, yeah. at the Lake Oval. And it was your farewell yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is, I'm not trying to sort of reopen the wound, the, the, the gap that was obviously existed between you and Stewie, but you had won five best and fairest in seven years at South. Yeah. So, w was there something that set off? That created this rift between you and the uh, coach. Nothing, nothing in particular. No, nothing, nothing really. Was it the way mind. you played? No. And actually, I've run across Stewie quite a bit over the years, and you know, everything's quite amicable. Mm. You know, from a social aspect. Would, might he have been thinking that you had just too much influence at South, that you ran your own race and virtually captain coached that team? Is that, is that a fair observation? Or uh, no, I think that's that's taking a bit too far, Mike. Yeah, no, I. I I just pretty much tried to do what was best for the team and just, mm. you know... Were you offended? Could... Were you offended when you when you were unloaded by the footy club that you'd grown up supporting and, and playing for? Oh, I guess I, I felt a little bit taken taken back by it. But uh, as I say, that was a decision that wasn't was out of my hands really at the time. So I, as I say, it wasn't on my volition, yeah. you know, to, to go. But because uh, growing up as a kid, you live in the area, you think you barrack for the local, you ba play for the, if you're good mm. enough, you play for the local VFA team, Port Melbourne. Then if, you, if you're good enough, you go and play with the, uh, the VFL team, as it was in South Melbourne, and uh, perhaps then when you finish your career there, you come back to Port, you know. Because so, there, were, there were, a lot of, uh, were a lot of people, players who played at Port, uh, even preceding my time, I'm sure could have gone across to, to South and played mm. league football, but sort of they were made to feel a little bit uncomfortable if they wanted to leave yeah, because of, yeah. you know, as I say, the closeness of the community and, uh, as I say, it was like a, a big country country town, a country club, you know. Did, did, did going to Carlton diminish your love for, for the Swans? Not really, no, no. I no, oh, know you, you were going to present, had, had the Swans won the Premiership last year, you were going to present the Cup, weren't you? Oh, I was, and, and un unbelievably so. I, uh, I remember I caught up with my brother-in-law and his, his wife up in... Uh, this up in Clarendon Street in South Melbourne, and uh, we had dinner up there. And I was working my way back to Port along uh, Pickle Street, and the phone rang. There we are, Peter. The phone, yeah. 
the phone rang and it was uh, Andrew Ireland. And uh, he said, oh, Peter, he said, uh, Andrew here, he said, uh, if the Swans happen to win the grand final on Sunday, would you be prepared, prepared to present the cup? I said, oh, Andrew, you know, I'd, I'd, I teared up a bit. Did today. you? Yeah, yeah, I did, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. So what a, what a humbling you yeah. know, experience and an honour, you know, sort of. Yeah, no, they were just a little bit too good on the day. Mm, they uh, were. Yeah, yeah. I want to take you back to one cricket one. Yep. When you were young, uh, Port Adelaide made an approach to you to go and play crick- uh, footy in Adelaide with Port Adelaide and play cricket for South Australia, and there was a suggestion that Sir Donald Bradman had his fingerprints on that. Is that true? Well, I remember uh, I got a letter from uh, from Port Adelaide from Bob McLean uh, asking whether I'd made up my mind to come across. You know, there was an offer on the put forward, and uh, with it, it was a, there was an opportunity to perhaps play cricket with South Australia as well. To uh, and Sir Donald, he mentioned that Sir Donald uh, was inquiring as to whether I was coming across, mm-hmm. and uh, the opportunity if I'd have gone. Probably the opportunity to probably advance my cricketing career might have been enhanced, but regret or not? Uh, well, I, well, I probably uh, if I'd have gone across, I, I wouldn't have won the Brownlow. But no. you know, things happen, Mike, for a reason, I guess. In the pure sense of the footy, yep. you you played half forward and centre, right? Yes. Yep. And you twice kicked fifty goals in a year for a battling team. Yep. Uh, you must have taken a lot of pride out of that. Oh yes, yeah. I uh, well, it's just. Part of the part of the job, you you know, you sort of uh, you, you tend when you I think back, you know, used to used to get, used to give, and used to do, you know. Yeah. So you had, you was, there wasn't one sort of facet that you you didn't sort of try and involve yourself. But midfielders in. today, yeah, if they kick twenty or more goals, that's a notable achievement. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It, uh, I think I'd love to be running around today, Mike. And <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's been a great life. I must say, we're born in the same year. Yeah, exactly. I was envious of you for so long, being able to do what you did yeah. and so good at what you did in, in football and cricket. You're entitled to be really proud of what you've done, mate. I'm not sure that I can still come to terms with the fact that cricket is closer in your heart than what football is, but it's been great whichever way it feels. Thanks very much, Mike. I've been blessed with my sporting career. Very fortunate. Thank you. This has been a Fox Footy production, part of the Fox Sports Network.